Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here. Quite a bit to go through today. Kind of a lot of news for a Friday, but obviously we'll start with the stock, which finished up 11% today, 10.8%, to $1,544.65, pushing through the 1500 barrier that it flirted with for a couple hours there before close and then accelerating to end the day. Obviously at an all-time high close and completely skipping over closing in the 1400 range. Tesla's market cap now sits right around $286 billion, which, according to a tracker from dogsofthedow.com, means that all of a sudden Tesla is now a top 15 most valuable company on the U.S. markets, slotting in at 14 right between J.P. Morgan Chase and MasterCard. The stock today really started taking off right around 12.30 Eastern time. Tough to say exactly what caused that. May have been related to some Elon tweets that we'll go through here in a bit, but more likely I think just the growing expectation for Tesla to post a second quarter profit and be eligible for inclusion in the S&P 500 and the market's understanding of the ramifications of that. Many of you have asked me to do an episode on how that S&P 500 inclusion process unfolds, so I am still in the middle of doing research on that, but yesterday Reuters did publish an article with the headline of Tesla appears poised to electrify S&P 500. That article was then syndicated through a number of different media outlets today, including by the New York Times about an hour before the big rise in the stock price today, so I do think that was a factor. Obviously, a company with a market cap as large as Tesla is a rare occurrence to be added to the S&P 500, perhaps unprecedented. So the article mentions an analyst that has looked back through history and found a maybe comparable situation of Yahoo in 1999, which ended up increasing by 64% in the five trading days between the announcement that it would be included in the S&P 500 and the actual date of inclusion. The article also quotes the head of index and ETF research at Virtue Financial, who expects that indexes tracking the S&P 500 would need to own about 25 million shares of Tesla stock once it's added to the S&P 500. Obviously, 25 million shares is a lot. I've actually seen even higher estimates up to maybe 40 to 50 million shares versus a float share count, which is essentially an estimate of how many shares are actually available and not locked up by insiders of about 147 million in total, according to Yahoo Finance. Obviously, if 25 million new shares need to be purchased from the 140 million that are available, some of those 140 million have to sell. And as we talked about a couple of days ago, if nobody wants to, then the price can just keep going up and up and up. So I think a lot of the buying right now is probably in anticipation of that. People buying shares now in preparation to sell them to the index funds that need to track the S&P 500 once the inclusion does happen. Personally, I am pretty bullish here in the short term because of this, but one caution that I would throw out there Without more research, we don't exactly know how comparable that Yahoo situation was or any other company for that matter, because you don't know how expected or unexpected the inclusion is. So for Tesla, obviously at this point, it's pretty widely expected. So this may already be front run and there may not be a bump once the actual inclusion happens because of all the shares that are being stockpiled now to sell when those funds need them. Also worth noting that over the last two weeks, Tesla shares are up 61%. So again, still doing more research on this, but that does seem obviously to be a factor at play. Oh, and while I didn't see it myself, I did hear that CNBC today was also talking about the S&P 500 inclusion for Tesla, so that could be another reason, again, for the stock appreciation specifically today. Next thing I want to mention here kind of at the open is that Tesla has now set a new date for their annual shareholder meeting for 2020, as well as the highly anticipated battery day. This was supposed to be on September 15th tentatively. Tesla has now announced a new schedule saying that the shareholder meeting will be held in person on Tuesday, September 22nd at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time at the Fremont factory in California. And then about battery day, they say, quote, eligible stockholders may also attend Tesla's separate battery day presentation, which will be held on the same day with additional details to be announced at a later time, end quote. That is all I know right now about attendance for battery day. I would imagine that Tesla would need to apply some sort of capacity limit on that, but I'm sure we'll hear more about it. Tesla says here that additional details are to come. I would imagine that would be part of those additional details, but if I hear anything else, I will let you know. Tesla does, of course, here say that they will continue to monitor public health and travel safety protocols, and that if they need to, they will change the date, time, or location of the event with prior notice. All right, now I want to go through some interesting Elon Musk tweets for the day. The first one here is a response to an article from Tesmanian on Volvo registering a Model Y in Sweden. They likely imported that over to study the vehicle, and writer Ava Fox of the article in the tweet said, Model Y should become a wake-up call for all automakers, no matter what they produce. Elon replied to this and said, quote, Berlin Model Y is the one to watch. That is a revolution in automotive body engineering, parentheses, finally, end quote. 
Definitely an exciting enough tweet on its own, but Elon did reply to a couple follow-up questions on Twitter as well. Somebody asked, single or two-piece frame cast? And Elon replied saying, even more. Someone else asked, full body casting? And Elon replied with the side eye emoji. This concept isn't entirely new. We have seen a patent from Tesla before for unibody casting machine. And Elon actually discussed it on the Ride the Lighting podcast with Ryan McCaffrey in an interview early last year, saying, quote, when we get the big casting machine, it'll go from 70 parts to one with a significant reduction in capital expenditure on all the robots to put those parts together, end quote. He also mentioned the casting process for the Model Y in the interview with Third Row earlier this year, saying, quote, the current version of Model Y has basically two big high-pressure die-cast aluminum castings that are joined, and there's still a bunch of other bits that are attached. Later this year, we'll transition to the rear underbody being a single-piece casting that also integrates the rear crash rails, end quote. Elon here seems to be talking about taking things a step further beyond just the rear underbody to the entire frame of the vehicle. Definitely something I'll be interested to hear people's thoughts on in the comments. We already talked about Sandy Monroe being extremely impressed with the cost control and the design of the Model Y. So what is really exciting is what it'll look like a couple evolutions from today, and it seems like that's what will be happening in Gigafactory Berlin. Elon also threw out a side eye emoji in response to this original Model Y tweet with someone asking him, are you sticking to modules or going straight from cell to pack? We also heard Elon discuss that logic on the third row interview. I'd imagine we'll hear more about that at Battery Day as well, but it sounds like they'll take that direction with the Gigafactory Berlin made Model Y. What'll be interesting is whether they take that direction with Gigafactory Shanghai's Model Y, as that would really be the first new product line for Tesla since Elon has mentioned the cell to pack skipping modules. The next tweet here also relates to something we talked about yesterday, which is just the massive amount of anticipation there will be for Tesla's next product. We get a little bit of a teaser here from Elon. Somebody asked him, quote, what about a smaller European style hatchback? End quote, saying that the Model Y was too big for some cities in Europe. Elon said, quote, probably a good one to design and engineer in Germany. End quote. So the fog may be starting to clear a little bit around those future product lines. Maybe we'll see some sort of mini Model 3 from China and a mini Model Y from Europe. That would seem to make a lot of sense, and then maybe simultaneously or shortly thereafter we see some sort of ground-up design for an autonomous vehicle, rather than what we have today where I think we have the dual purpose, personal ownership, and autonomy. Last quick tweet here that is very relevant to me and some of our listeners. Somebody on Twitter asked Elon if Tesla could add a 10 second forward feature to the user interface for audio, specifically to skip forward in podcasts, and Elon replied saying, quote, in general, we need to improve how podcasts play, end quote. I'm definitely all for that, and I replied yes and recommendations if possible because Tesla would seemingly have the data to power a recommendation engine, and if Apple or the other podcasting apps for whatever reason aren't going to choose to do that, well then hey, maybe Tesla will. Next quick note here, Tesla has received approval from the Dell Valley School District in Texas for the requested property tax reductions on the Gigafactory Texas proposal. So that is one step forward for a Gigafactory Texas, but it does still need to be approved by the Travis County Commissioner's Office. Next today, we have an update on short interest for Tesla stock. I've gotten some questions on this. I haven't been reporting on it because it's been relatively steady, but thought worth checking in on. We do have new short interest as of June 30th, and it did decline. So we're now at 14 million shares sold short versus 15.1 million shares sold short on June 15th. That 14 million shares, that is the lowest number of shares sold short since March 31st of 2011. But of course, at that time, there were far fewer outstanding shares, I think only about 13 million. So the percentage of outstanding shares sold short right now is only about 7.5%, and I believe that is an all-time low. If we look at the float shares, again, that's about 147 million according to Yahoo. That would be about 9.5% of float. So low for Tesla standards, but still relatively high compared to other stocks. The valuation of those shares did actually increase slightly though. So on June 15th, the stock was around 990. So the roughly 15 million shares sold short at that time represented about $15 billion in valuation. Now on June 30th, the stock price had gone up by 9% to about $1,080 per share, meaning that while the number of shares sold short went down, the valuation of those shares actually went up slightly to 15.1 billion. That, I believe, is actually an all-time high for Tesla if we're just looking strictly at the value. I would guess that over the last week and a half, short interest has continued to decline, but if it hasn't and those 14 million shares are still sold short, that would mean that the valuation today of those shares at the $1,544 price would be about $21.5 billion. But again, I would expect we've seen some covering. 
So the next update and insight that we'll get into this will be on a Friday, July 24th after market close, so the week of earnings, but that report will be for the settlement date of Wednesday, July 15th. So we won't get any insight into post earnings short interest until the next release after market close on Tuesday, August 11th. All right, next I wanted to share an article that I think could be helpful for some people. This is from Benzinga and the headline here is quote, why a Tesla margin requirement changes could be a buying opportunity. If you're unfamiliar with margin, basically it's just borrowing from your broker generally for the purpose of purchasing more stock, then you pay interest on that loan to your broker. But there are certain requirements that you have to maintain so that you're not borrowing too much on margin relative to the amount that you have in your account because the brokerage wants to be able to know that you're gonna be able to pay back that margin loan with your assets. So anyway, this article talks about how the Benzinga founder and CEO received a message on Friday morning, this morning, from E-Trade, letting him know that they had actually increased those margin maintenance requirements on his Tesla position. When a maintenance requirement like that increases, you may go from being totally fine on your margin requirements to being not fine, and that's a margin call, in which case you actually have to sell some stock or add new money to your account to get back to those required balanced levels. And this is just completely up to the brokerage, however they want to set their margin requirements. Though obviously they have to be somewhat reasonable as there are other brokerages that they have to compete with. Those margin requirements too are generally higher if the portfolio is more concentrated as that adds more perceived risk because one company could go bankrupt overnight, but the entire S&P 500, for example, isn't going to go bankrupt overnight. So anyway, the Benzinga founder had his margin maintenance requirement raised by E-Trade and he actually had to sell some stock because of that to get back in the requirements. And his take on this was, quote, a lot of people that got this message yesterday had to sell shares. Multiple people I talked to overnight were forced to liquidate Tesla shares. Multiple people. And these are people who were positive up on Tesla, and they had to sell by the close yesterday. This is happening because large institutions are buying shares of Tesla, and brokerage firms want to free up shares to sell these large institutions. End quote. So look, this is speculative reasoning by him, but it does make sense to me. And I wanted to make sure to point it out for those of you that are invested and potentially using margin with a concentrated Tesla position. Be very careful, that gives up a lot of power to your brokerage to do a lot of things, and if they or their larger clients want those shares, there are ways that they can shake some of them free like this. So be diligent, make sure you fully understand the margin requirements in your account if you are using margin, because getting margin called is no fun. Those of you that have listened for a long time know that I got margin called in June last year after the really steep drop that we saw in Tesla, so I had to sell some shares at the worst possible time when all I wanted to do was buy more. Just a word of caution there, and then the last thing today is just an update on Rivian. They have raised another $2.5 billion. Looks like from the same investors that they have had in the past. We have T. Rowe Price, Soros Fund, Fidelity, Barron Capital, Amazon, and BlackRock. And Rivian CEO RJ Scringe in the release said, quote, We are focused on the launch of our R1T, R1S, and Amazon delivery vehicles. With all three launches occurring in 2021, our teams are working hard to ensure our vehicles, supply chain, and production systems are ready for a robust production ramp up. We are grateful for the strong investor support that helps enable us to focus on execution of our products, end quote. So Rivian definitely has the capital and I'm excited to see how they progress next year. All right, that'll wrap it up for today. As always, huge thank you for listening. Hope everybody has an awesome weekend. Make sure you're subscribed here, signed up for notifications and following me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. And I'll see you next week for the Monday, July 13th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.